Uh, welcome to Ultrascaling with Redis Enterprise. Hey, my name is Anna, I'm Customer Success Manager at Redis Labs. Been doing this for three years. Uh, this talk is about uh, some uh, re real life challenges our customers uh, facing every day and how we help them to overcome it. Uh, before I start, I would like to show, uh, the show to get a show of hands who is using Redis now. Okay, Redis Enterprise. Cool. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, let's start. Uh, the need to scale is a good thing. Let me start with this. If you need to scale, this means that you've done something right. Uh, your application, your website is successful and uh, probably faster than you anticipated. And uh, you just need to find the right uh, uh, team to help you with it, to do it fast, seamlessly, effortlessly if possible. and. Uh, this is where we help uh, with Red, come with Redis Labs to help you do it. Um, so I'm going to discuss uh, common bottlenecks of uh, our customers and uh, how we help. Uh, let me start with the simple uh, uh, use cases. Uh, when customers start, they start small. They find this cool thing called Redis seems like, like it can handle anything, so they just start throwing things at Redis and it works fast um, without effort. Uh, and uh, then uh, when uh, they do uh, something real uh, successful, um, they, raise into, they run into problems. And the uh, first problem probably would be limitation of a single Redis shard because this is easy to deploy and this is what most of the customers start with. Uh, first problem I'd like to talk, to, uh, uh, to talk about is max memory. Uh, max memory, when, when single Redis is uh, running out of memory, basic things that you would do is uh, increase the max memory, like you've saved the day, right? you no, not getting these out of memory uh, errors in the application, all is good, but all it gives you just a time to plan for the next step, because eventually you will run out of, out of RAM on a single node. Now, when you run out of RAM on a single node, what you would do is just replace it with a stronger node, which is good as well, uh, but then, uh, as you know, uh, most of you probably, already heard it uh, this morning from Salvatore that uh, Redis is uh, mostly single-threaded, so it utilizes one core of a node. When you're scaling up the machine, you're not only scaling up the memory, you're also scaling up the CPUs, so the machine becomes expensive for what you do. And this is uh, the first problem of a single shard. The second problem is hitting max CPU of a single shard. And uh, the first thing that we do at uh, Redis Labs is not necessary scaling, uh, because we really want you to be efficient and uh, we want you to succeed. And sometimes throwing money to sell, solve a problem is a good start, but eventually you want to actually uh, be cost efficient, right? So one of the questions that I would ask is, uh, are you using uh, your data types efficiently? Are you familiar with the data types? Are you using uh, strings where you should use hashes? Uh, and uh, by doing that, for instance, what you can do is uh, uh, get uh, the whole key uh, to only touch a single element, and then you know that you are using your data type uh, inefficiently. Uh, are you using sorted sets when all you need is lists? and then you may, may be pay, paying the penalty of the CPU. Another question that we would ask is, uh, uh, do you use heavy commands? We can uh, also help you to find if you do, and help you to find the solution to it. What are heavy commands? These are, some of them are listed here. These are keys, S members, H get all. Probably if you go, everyone who went to uh, Redis IO saw that keys is not uh, meant for production. Although everyone who uses Redis are getting the, just the common library, which 
it, it is common that are using not efficient commands, but just uh, it getting the job done at the beginning. And the keys command, the usage of keys command goes uh, unseen because you still have small redis and keys, the complexity of keys command will be small in this case. But when you're starting to grow and you don't have 500 keys, you have 1,000 or 100,000 keys and more, then the, you, you will see this unstable performance of Redis, which you don't use to, but now you need to start learning what to do with it. Same goes with S members when the sets are going bigger than the anticipated age get all, getting all the hash instead of getting specific elements. L range is a popular, when you start, you have lists to processing maybe jobs, you get the whole list and uh, because it was small you didn't uh, see any, any latency spikes but uh, with L and so you were using L range like 0 minus 1 getting the whole list now you start need to uh, to think about uh, getting chunks of the list uh, and another question that the, let's say that we figured out the the answer to the first question the second question that we ask is your Redis designed for a scale? What I mean by that is, as I said, when you start with Redis, you throw everything at it and it seems fine, but uh, is it actually right? Is it actually right that your uh, leaderboard will be on the same Redis as uh, your PubSub? Uh, is it actually right that uh, your batch processing will be with a serving layer of Redis? And the answer to, the, to this, of course, no. Uh, Redis has uh, different uh, replication persistence options. It has different eviction uh, policies. You can decide either to backup or not. There is no need to backup a session store, uh, which is volatile. There is no need to backup a PubSub database. But if this is a database that you want to be persistent, the, then you don't want to mix and match. And this is why the question is always, is, is it a good architecture what you have? So at Redis Labs, what we have, uh, the solution is to reshard. When, this, uh, when we answered all the questions and everything is, is planned, uh, but you just uh, getting this uh, excitement of just scaling, then what you need to do is reshard. Resharding at Redis Labs is uh, you, you will get instant improve in, uh, improvement of performance. Why? Because you are running suddenly on multiple cores. Because suddenly all those huge uh, machines that you had that were only utilizing uh, one core of, of a machine, uh, now you can actually utilize all the cores. So it is uh, nice to see how the latency suddenly drops. And uh, another good thing at resharding with Redis Labs is that it does not, does not require code change. Uh, we, do, we take the whole data set, we shard it into chunks. From the application perspective, it still connects to the same endpoint. It doesn't, it doesn't need to be aware of cluster architecture behind the scenes. From the client perspective, it's still one Redis, so you can use the same client. Questions? Okay, so uh, let's assume that we now fixed the problem of a single shard. Now you're running uh, at uh, sharded Redis, and you actually now can utilize the whole node. The common bottlenecks of a node would be CPU, memory, and network. Redis is all about speed. So here's your speed limit on Redis. When the infrastructure cannot support the speed, you get these latency spikes. You get these simple commands of complexity of one that are suddenly taken 14 milliseconds. Why? Because one of the resources of your node is saturated. How we solve it at Redis Labs? Since the database now is sharded, it's really simple to scale up. By scale up, I mean to take the existence node, existent node that's currently CPU saturated and replace it with a node that has more CPUs. Uh, if, uh, and the same goes for memory. 
if your node runs out of memory because it's running 10 shards, give it more memory. Eventually, every uh, data center, every cloud has its maximum node capacity. So what we can do at Regis Labs at, with Regis Enterprise is seamless scale out. We just add nodes to the same cluster and, re and uh, rebalance the shards, moving shards to different nodes. Again, <coughs> seamless to the client, no need to change anything in the, at the client level. Application still works with the same endpoint. Behind the scenes, it can be cluster with 20 nodes, 100 shards, 200 shards, 1,000 shards. Doesn't matter. From your application perspective, it works with the endpoint. Now, when you go to these big clusters and you go grow in these databases, they start to get bigger and bigger. And uh, when you get to some terabytes of uh, data in RAM, it starts to be expensive to run it on RAM. RAM is an expensive. Uh, um, so what we did at Redis Labs, uh, we decided to utilize the cheaper, uh, cheaper storage that we have on uh, AWS machines, for instance, uh, is NVMe uh, storage. It, we use it as an extension to RAM, and uh, suddenly you have uh, l you you can use less machines to run the same size of Redis. Now, the go first thing we overcome the RAM size of a single node. Second, we reduce the hardware costs, and everything is done again without a single line uh, code, code change. Uh, it's done, uh, it, it's not locking you to a specific, to our technology. We made sure that this is 100% Redis. The application is not aware that this, this is Redis on flash. And even, and so you're not locked in. If you decide you don't like the latency, although it still will be sub-millisecond latency, you can always move back to RAM. But this is com Redis, just utilizing NVMe uh, SSD. So, and uh, the next po uh, painful point of, uh, of, a no of a node uh, being saturated is a network. When you're running so much throughput, uh, many shards on a single node, the network eventually gets saturated. And uh, we have a proprietary feature which we call multi-proxy. And uh, we allow actually to utilize network of uh, multiple nodes in the cluster. So you, again, seamlessly for the application, application uses the endpoint and we are able to route the request to a, a specific shard where the key is located. Uh, I, this is, there is no uh, free stuff, of course, this adds chattiness to the network. So it can go, uh, get you that far. And this is why uh, one of the recent uh, features that we added is support to Redis Enterprise of OSS Cluster API. We now support the smart clients of Redis. <coughs> and uh, this is truly allows you uh, linear scalability. Uh, and, but the problem is that you need to learn how to use smart client. David here will uh, uh, get on stage after me and show you how we use open source cluster API. And, the, and you already probably saw on the keynote. So to recap, uh, scaling with Redis Enterprise is easy uh, because we have a team that's doing it 24-7 and we are doing only Redis. So you can imagine that we are experts in it. We talked about uh, efficient implementation. Re always remember when you start, think how to use Redis at, uh, to it best, the correct structure to the correct problem, use the correct commands, think about complexity. Think about uh, architecture and logical uh, separation uh, because it's important 
when you want to do a maintenance on your session store, you don't want to impact your PubSub functionality, for instance. With Redis Labs, uh, with Redis Enterprise, you have seamless scale up and out. And uh, uh, I would like to mention also that uh, when we be, when we reshard the shards, the reason we, resh we decide to reshard at a certain point, well, although you do, you know that you can run shards that are big on a node, like 100 gigabyte, this is what we see usually on elastic cache, big, big nodes uh, utilizing one core, but big shards. The reason that we are not doing it is because uh, having a big shard, when it's working, it's fine. When you need to do maintenance, you might need to migrate it to some place. Uh, when there is a node failure, you need to sync 100 gigabyte shard. It takes time. During this time, your database uh, can be at downtime if you don't have slave, if you are recovering from RDB or from AOF. Or uh, you're just, it, it can take time that it, at this time, if another node fails, then uh, you, you might lose your data and need to recover from backup. So there, there is a, re, we are really minded of the data of Redis being a primary data store. Running big shards is, is uh, dangerous. Try not to do it. We talked about Redis on Flash. This is, uh, again, just Redis utilizing NVMe storage and uh, you can use the same code. Multi-proxy, our proprietary uh, solution to utilize network of multiple nodes, and the uh, OSS cluster API, which David will can now talk about. <laughs> I leave the questions, I think, for later, unless there's some burning question that you want to ask. Okay. So as you can see, I'm the evil guy, right? So Anna had all these nice little minions in her presentations, so I thought I'd pick up the theme a bit and, uh, yeah. Uh, anyway. <laughs> so, um, I mean, what are typical performance requirements you're having? And uh, here are a few listed, or like throughput, or latency, or scalability, or you need to have a kind of predictive performance, or efficiency, and so on, right? And uh, Redis, is providing all this for you, right? As you can see here, we can scale from thousands of operations per second up to millions per, of operations per second at sub milliseconds latency. We are basically are, can do this with a comparable low number of nodes or in comparison to other vendors out in the market. And most importantly, the performance behavior is predictive, right? So if you size it correctly, so to pick up uh, Anna's point, right, if you size it correctly. So uh, <laughs> what, is the, uh, what is the open source cluster API for? So beside of the fact that you can uh, uh, yeah, orchestrate open source clusters with it, what we actually picked up uh, at Redis Labs, uh, Redis Labs is the, uh, the discovery part of it, which means that uh, a client can send uh, a cluster slots request to the cluster, to a database, by getting the topology back. So it knows, oh, uh, the, this slot range is served by this endpoint, basically, or another slot range is served by this endpoint, which means that a cluster, our uh, open source cluster API-enabled client is actually a smart client, because the smart client has uh, knowledge about the topology of the cluster and having this knowledge it is actually doing the the uh, the hash based sharding or let's say it's executing a hash function based on a key it's getting a, a slot and then, then it's looking up okay which endpoint is actually responsible for for this uh, slot and then it's sending the command directly to this endpoint or uh, in this case directly to redis shards or uh, which means that there is no additional network hop or uh, of using a proxy, right? Okay, 
So we had a test scenario, and you can see our, in Redis Enterprise, it looks slightly different. Uh, in Redis Enterprise, we actually have a proxy in between. But uh, this is not a big deal, and actually sometimes even a benefit, because this proxy is sticky to local shards. So this proxy is more acting like, a, like front end threats. Right? So you're basically getting a lot of requests in, and maybe you don't leverage pipelining, and so you get a lot of small requests, so single requests in, and the proxy is basically re-pipelining then, putting it in a, in a pipeline on a kind of a lower number of connections, and so the performance or behavior of the proxy is actually beneficial, and uh, it being, being only communicating to local shards means actually that uh, you get performance out of it under specific circumstances, right? So the proxy in this case especially doesn't uh, forward requests to other nodes, right? So basically, if you get a request in which is mapped to the endpoint, which is served by the proxy, and uh, the proxy is basically realizing, oh, uh, I, I'm not responsible for this shard anymore because it moved to another node or there was a failover or whatever, right? The proxy is sending you back this moved response the same way as the open source uh, cluster would do, right? Okay, but uh, what was our test scenario, beside of the fact that we used this setup? Uh, we had uh, a bunch of server instances, so M4 16x large, or quite beefy machines, 64 cores each, and so on. We had uh, a bunch of client instances, C4 8x large, uh, also comparable beefy, right? And the reason for that is actually network bandwidth. So in, our, in AWS or most of the cloud environments, smaller machines have uh, less good network. And if you need to have something like 10 gigabits or, or more, then you need to use beefy machines, right? So we had to use quite beefy machines as our load injectors here. Then, because otherwise we would have needed even more and then the cost would be more or less the same, right? <laughs> uh, okay, so Redis Enterprise was used. Uh, we had a sparse shards placement, which means that the, the shards are actually spread across the nodes evenly. So we had only master shards, no replication in this at this point, because replication would contribute to the network utilization. And we didn't want to test uh, when we reach network utilization. We actually wanted to test our, our server so software, right? So basically, we disabled our, our replication for, for this test. And uh, we had a comparable small item size, 100 bytes, only sets and gets. Uh, it was a one-to-one -one ratio of sets to gets, so one, one read for one write. Uh, and we decided to have a small pipeline size, uh, comparable small, at nine, right? I mean, you can inject much more traffic if you want, and maybe you reach much higher numbers if you want by using huge pipelines. But uh, the question is, how realistic is a huge pipeline? Or how real world is a huge pipeline? I mean, there are use cases where a huge pipeline makes sense, but there are a lot of use cases where you don't really use a use a pipeline of 40 or something like that in real life. So we, we thought something like a pipeline of nine is still a realistic value, right? Okay, so what, what did we reach in the first step? We reached five million operations per second. We used 60 shards spread over three nodes or we counted 1,140 connections. Or, and we have to say here, connection means that each client which we have, or each client injecting traffic, is connected to each endpoint, right? So to each proxy in this case. And we reach something like, uh, yeah, five million operations per second at one millisecond latency, actually slightly lower than one millisecond. So we, we target every time something like 0.9.8 milliseconds, right? But it's around one millisecond. Okay. So here you can see our, our the test results a bit. Or so the, the first one is giving us our 5 million operations per second. And you can also see on the right-hand side um, how many operations per node were achieved. And there is sometimes a bit discrepancy across the test runs, right? Something like 10% discrepancy, or you can see this here. But um, yeah, this is uh, due to the, the infrastructure conditions. They are not always the same in AWS, even if they are quite constant, right? Sometimes we applied a new optimization and we got better numbers and so on, right? I 
actually. Okay. Okay, so next thing, as you could see, we, we did this mainly as a scalability test. So we basically started with 5 million operations per second, increasing step by step. And here you can see that we basically also reached 30 million operations per second. Uh, and here you can see the overview, basically, uh, meaning actually it's hard to see. Can you see this or not? Raise your hand if you can, uh, can see the numbers. Okay, <laughs> so I need to read it. <laughs> actually. So the first one is 10 million operations per second, the next one is uh, 20, and the next one is 30. Uh, in the first step we used 6 nodes, in the next one we basically used 12 nodes, and finally we used 18 nodes, which means uh, it's proven that it, that it skates linearly, right? Here a little bit details about, okay, 30 million operations per second, we used 18 machines, Again, M4, 16x large. Much more connections are in order to inject the traffic. And again, our a millisecond latency, right? And here we have a demo. It's more or less the same demo as we have seen to today, today morning. So here are the 26 nodes, 512 shards, because I'm testing the open source or uh, cluster API, I called it our uh, API benchmark. Uh, this console window, which you could see in the middle, is basically I'm using Ansible in order to orchestrate my, my test execution on the target side. So basically you could see firing up some of the test clients on the, on the different machines. In this case, I used 18 injector machines and each of these injector machines was running multiple clients. And uh, yeah, it's driving you crazy if you basically have to do this uh, manually, right? so uh, uh, it's, uh, it's automated, basically. And uh, yeah, the point is, finally, we reached with 512 shards, uh, as part of this scalability test, 50 million operations at about one millisecond latency. So can you see here something like 102 millisecond, but there was a little spike at the beginning, which is not visible if you basically run it further, basically. Here we go, right? So linear scalability with Redis uh, using the open source uh, cluster API are uh, proven by this benchmark, let's say, right? So from three nodes with about five million operations per second up to 26 nodes, nodes with 50 million operations per second, right? Here again, 512 shards, 26 machines, 32,000 connections, or a bit more than that, at one millisecond latency, uh, and we are happy to answer questions now, right? Um, so I know you mentioned something about the like network connection bandwidth on the nodes, um, but I was looking uh, the number of shards you're using. You're using 20 shards per node. Yeah. Um, does that correspond to the number of CPU cores, or why why did you pick that number? <laughs> not exactly, because we actually not just have uh, CPU cores utilized by by the shards, right? So the the best practice rule is not to exceed something like 80% CPU usage, right? are in total on the machines. And then in addition to the shards, we actually have the proxy. And uh, I mentioned that the proxy is used as a kind of front end threat uh, thing, right? Which means that we have a bunch of front end threats there as well in order to dispatch the, the, uh, the commands to the, to the actual shards, right? And there we have also something like 20, 20 threats running, right? Which means that having a 64 core machines or 40, 40 CPUs or, or CPU cores utilized to a, to a good degree, basically keeping some headroom seem to be, seem to be a good good compromise. Thanks. Would you be recommending using M4 or I3 for this? Uh, so does it matter? 
The i3 machines actually are machines with NVMe drives attached, right? So you're paying more for i3 machines with the same uh, RAM and CPU or CPU count, right? Because what you get in addition to the to the raw CPU uh, performance and, and amount of RAM is you get NVMe drives, right? So I think i3 8x large have something like or uh, eight eight NVMe drives or something like that, and uh, you pay for that, right? So if you have Redis on RAM, then maybe M4. If you have Redis on Flash, then i3, right? Do you want to join me or? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> So in the in the diagram uh, in the screen, there were two proxies and uh, uh, you know two boxes for the Redis uh, nodes, right? In the in one of the diagrams, and the proxies were going to the individual nodes, right? So how the data replication between those nodes happens? I'm asking about a multi data center situation wherein mm -hmm. you know one data center goes to one proxy and another data center goes to another proxy no, no it's not how it is deployed basically in Redis enterprise we deployed it in the way that each so actually the the proxy policy is called all master shards right which means each node which is hosting a master shard is basically having a proxy running a proxy process running which is multi-threaded right which makes sense because each node having a master shard is basically facing front end is facing traffic right so you basically need to take this traffic and and forward it the the advantage of using the open source cluster api in this picture and it was just a diagram right so in, in theory you have a proxy on every node running uh, the advantage is that these proxies are sticky to the local shards so basically such a proxy will never really forward what a request to another node, right? Such a proxy will only work with the shards on the same node. And if it can't reach a shard which is responsible for this slot range regarding the hashing, which happened up front on the client side, it will reply with something like moved, right? And then the client usually, I mean, if a node died and a failover happened, the client usually would do something like, okay, hey, let's execute cluster slots again fetch the topology again, so I have an updated one, and let's retry to set my command, right? Any other question? Maybe for Anna? <laughs> oh. uh, sorry, I missed you. <laughs> so you, you mentioned that the average uh, response time is around a millisecond. Yeah. I just wonder what the, uh, the 99th percentile was, like how consistent was that millisecond response uh, time? So I don't have these numbers here. We can talk about it later if you want, right? But uh, the uh, response time is quite consistent, basically, right? We measure this on the car. We actually measure the uh, the one millisecond on the server side, right? Uh, and we measure the uh, the uh, the average uh, percentile on the client side, right? So it's two measurement values. So it's not exactly possible to compare them <laughs> one to one, right? But we can have a good idea that. The behavior is actually very consistent, right? Hi, uh, I had a question on this uh, 512 shards you guys had with uh, 50 million operations per second. 50 so million operations per yeah, second. Yeah, 50 million operations per second. So you guys had like a master slave in that setting, and did you guys? No, we like we didn't have master slave. Or I explained that we disabled replication because replication would contribute to the network load, basically. Which means if we would have enabled replication, then we would have more traffic on the network. Having more traffic on the network would basically cause to, to have a bottleneck there. And so we, we couldn't measure what is possible on the, on the server side, right? So, so, so what, what would you say is the general recommendation? Uh, if we are having shards, uh, do we need to kind of turn it off uh, the master-slave replication in a production no, environment? No, I mean... The general recommendation is not existing in this case, right? Because it depends on your use case. If you have a use case where you have high available requirements, then you can't get rid of the of the slave, right? Okay. But because uh, high availability is important for you. But there are use cases where you don't need high availability, right? So where you can risk or to lose your data if it is a pure cache and you don't have warm up requirements, then then or maybe you don't need replica if you have something like a like a session store, then maybe replication even makes sense because you would like to, to basically fail over as quick as possible by not giving your users a bad experience by needing to re-lock lock in again, right, or for, for a good amount. So it really depends on the use case and your 
high availability requirements. <laughs> if you have replication enabled or not, or if you have replication across multiple zones, which is basically adding to additional net network latency and so on, right? In this case, we didn't have replication here, right? And one last question was, what is the size of the database when you guys uh, do the testing on this? We basically tested uh, on a comparable small number of items. So we just loaded 10 million items to the database of a size of 100 bytes. But it, uh, we tested also our earlier uh, the, the first round basically with more items are, and the only thing we could see it actually is actually that it contributes to the population time, right? So it doesn't make a lot of difference later because each of these operations has a, we only use gets and set, sets has a complexity of one basically, right? So something like uh, doing one get or against, or against Redis has a complexity of one roughly, right? So it doesn't matter too much or too much if it is more or less items, right? You basically have random access anyway, out of memory. You had a question, right? Oh, uh, okay. Fine. There. Any additional questions? If not, then thank you. Right.